Alrighty, we are underway with the first regathering, Modern Israel, session 3, page 18 in your workbook, your notebook. Alright, let's do a quick review as to where we were last week. Last week we started our introductory material by asking the question, what is Zion? This is the biblical introductory material to the modern state. And we learned that Zion has a, a rather uh, interesting history. First of all, the term Zion was applied to the southeastern hill of Jerusalem where the Jebusite fortress was located. Uh, this uh, southeastern hill is in between the Kidron Valley on the east side, which is still visible today, and the Tyropian Valley on the west side, which is filled in with rubble today. Forty feet of rubble fill in that valley, so it's not visible today. Uh, but that, those two valleys uh, then um, help us see the southeastern hill, Mount Zion. Well, over the uh, period of time, over the pass of time, uh, the name expanded to include the Temple Mount to the north. That's Mount Moriah to the north, where the temple is, is located. As time passed, the name eventually uh, was a name for all of Jerusalem. And then, following that, uh, the name sometimes is attached to all of Judah, and sometimes the name is attached to the Jewish people. So there's a wide range of meaning to this term Zion. But basically, that's southeastern hill. Well, then we asked the question, what is Zionism? And we looked for some definitions. We went to the ultra-Orthodox website, Jews Not Zionists, and we saw that these ultra-Orthodox rabbis feel that Judaism is opposed to Zionism. And we read some of the statements by the rabbis that uh, support that, and their, their point of view is that uh, the modern state of Israel is heretical and arrogant and uh, destroys Jewish people. So they're not very happy about Zionism. But then we went to the United Nations. Well, how do they feel about Zionism? And we looked at Re Resolution 3379, and we saw that the United Nations, at, uh, between 1975 and 1991, determined that Zionism is a form of racism and racial discrimination. Well, that's not a very positive um, definition either, is it? So we have her heresy and arrogance and racism and racial discrimination. Then we went to... Uh, Stan Rittenhouse, the anti-Semitic Christian, and his book, The Fear of the Jews, and his opinion was that during this period of time between the first and second coming of Jesus Christ, a satanic counterfeit, political Zionism masquerading as the state of Israel will be established. So he feels that the modern state is satanic in nature. And then we went to the Palestinians. What do the Palestinians think of Zionism? And in section 22 of the Palestinian Charter, they say that Zionism is a political movement that is racist and fanatic and aggressive and expansionist and colonial and fascist. How many of you guys have been to Israel? Would you describe Israel as that way? No, oh, I don't think you would. Then we went to the Bible. What does the scripture say about Zionism? And Dr. Fruchtenbaum offered a, a definition based on the Bible. The word Zionism describes a feeling. Zionism as an expression of the longing and yearning that the Jewish people have had in the past and still have for their homeland. As soon as any Jew expressed a desire to go back to his land, he is expressing Zionism. And of course that was supported by, we just looked at one section of scripture, Psalm 137 verses uh, 1 through 6, where you can, you can just feel the emotional attachment of the Jewish people to, to um, the land of Israel. But Zionism is not simply a subjective emotion. It has other biblical evidence behind it. So the, uh, there's a number of covenants that support Zionism. So we began to look at the Abrahamic covenant. And remember the Abrahamic covenant was made with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then passed on to the 12 tribes. And it consists of three basic, three basic promises. The first promise is the land promise. That's the one we're most interested in the land of Israel. And it's twofold. God says to Abraham, I will give the land to you, Abraham, and to your descendants after you. So that's the first promise of the Abrahamic covenant. Second promise is the national promise. Again, twofold. Uh, I choose your family as the chosen people. So there's national election there. And your family will have a unique relationship with the Gentile nations, with the rest of the world. Those who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you will be cursed. So that's the national promise. 
And the third basic promise is the spiritual blessing promise, again twofold. I will bless you, Abraham, and you will be a blessing to others. Now, as we looked at the Abrahamic covenant and its three promises, we also learned that it is an eternal covenant, and we learned that it is an unconditional covenant, meaning it's unilateral. Its fulfillment depends on God alone. It does not depend on what the Jewish people do or do not do. God said, I will do this. And so Abraham was instructed to put together the, the uh, ancient Near Eastern uh, covenant ritual. Uh, this is a, a ritual that is very common in the ancient Near East. You would take some animals, so he takes the animals that God prescribes, and he slaughters them, and he cuts them in half, and sets uh, the pieces of the carcasses uh, side by side, so there's a path between them. And the people who were entering into this contract, into this covenant, would walk between the pieces. And basically they were uttering a self-curse upon themselves. The idea was, may what happened to these animals happen to me if I don't fulfill my end of the bargain. That, that's how covenants were signed and sealed in those days. And then we uh, saw that uh, the, the wild birds, the birds of prey that came down and wanted to feed off the carcasses were, were um, chased away by Abraham. And uh, the question was asked, what could the birds signify? And uh, there's a lot of opinions about what the birds could signify, but I think the uh, most conservative opinion that fits the context best, remember context is king, uh, is found in the Bible knowledge commentary. There the commentator said, uh, God's announcement of Israel's enslavement in verses 13 and 14. Now back in verse 10, it states that Abraham chased the birds away. So these are a few verses later. God's announcement of Israel's enslavement in verses 13 and 14 clarified the meaning of the attacking birds. Uh, they would represent e Egypt or anyone who would attack the covenant and want to defile it. Egypt, like birds of prey, opposed the covenant, but ultimately the covenant will be fulfilled. God promises the Jewish people, I am giving you this land, and I will see that the, my covenant finds its fulfillment. And again, that, was, um, that promise was again illustrated when uh, darkness came and a deep sleep fell upon Avram, and he did not walk through the pieces of the, of the covenant signing ceremony but he watched God walk between the pieces in the form, two forms of the Shekinah glory. One form was the blazing torch. That would be symbolic of the pillar of fire that led the Jewish people out of Egypt. And the other form of the Shekinah glory was the uh, smoking fire pot. And that would portray the pillar of smoke that led the people out of Egypt during the day. The pillar of fire at night, the pillar of smoke during the day. So here is a visual, audio-visual representation to Abraham of the promise that his people would go into exile for 400 years, but God would punish the nation that enslaved them and he would bring them out into the land. So he's encouraging Abraham with the uh, surety of his promises. Now as we looked at the boundaries of the promised land, and I didn't, I didn't go through all the verses in relation to that, but I gave you my conclusion regarding the boundaries of the promised land, from the Wadi Al Arish in the south to the, uh, the Euphrates River in the north. In other words, God has given the Jewish people the entire western arm of the Fertile Crescent. And I think you can see that the Jewish people have never possessed all of the promised land, and we do not do so today. Um, we possess perhaps 30% of the promised land today. And remember, we ended by pointing out the fact that the peoples that lived in this territory were the Canaanites. And the iniquity of the Amorites, the Canaanites, reached its fulfillment and God had them dispossessed from the land. And these people groups have all disappeared from history. They're all gone. They were not Arabs. They're all Canaanites. And it wasn't until some 2,800 years later that the Arab people, the Muslims, came out of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula and populated the land in any great numbers, 2,800 years later. So the Palestinian claim that Palestinians have been in the land since time or for time immemorial is a gross exaggeration, untrue. 
So that's where we left off last week. So now we pick it up on page 18. Question. How, it, it says that God causes sweet to fall on Abraham. How did he see and hear what God said? Well, it was a, a prophetic sleep. It was a uh, dreamlike sleep, something like that. He was aware of what was going on. It doesn't say that he watched God go behind Well, how, well, no, it doesn't say he watched him, but it describes the whole scene there. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay. So, well, Abra the point is Abraham did not pass through the pieces. That makes it a unilateral covenant. It's dependent on God alone. God has taken the responsibility alone for the, for the, uh, the fulfillment of the covenant. All right, um, let's go on to page 18, and we'll take a look at the next covenant that biblically supports Zionism. It's the Palestinian covenant, or as I prefer to call it, the land covenant. As you read in commentaries and in uh, study Bibles, etc., you will see this referred to as the Palestinian Covenant. I don't like that name in the slightest because uh, it doesn't describe what the covenant covers and the name is um, very inappropriate. So let me explain to you how the name Palestine uh, came about. If you go to Wikipedia and the article on Palestine, you will find accurate information. And this is what happened. The term was first used to denote an official province of the Roman Empire in 135 CE or 135 AD. Dates the same. When the Roman authorities, that's a reference to Emperor Hadrian, following the suppression of the Bar Kokhba revolt, that's the second Jewish revolt, combined Judea province with Galilee and other surrounding cities such as Ashkelon to form Syria Palestinia. Syria, land of the Philistines, is what that means. Land of the Philistines. Which some scholars state was in order to complete the disassociation with Judea. And that is exactly correct. Hadrian wanted to disassociate the Jewish people from their land. And this is one of the ways he did it. He also wanted to insult the Jewish people as well. Now here is a map of the Syria-Palestinian, uh, Syria-Palestine in the Roman Empire around 200 uh, BC to 350 AD, right around there. And the, uh, can, can you see Palestinia? Can you see the Roman province? There's Egypt and Arcadia and Arabia, and this is Palestinia. This is the Roman province that was. You guys want the map? You guys want the map? Okay. <laughs> what else do you want? The, the definitions of. Okay. All right. Palestine. I should have known. And the map. All right, you'll have it next week. And then we're going to need a thicker binder. Yeah, yeah well, that's thick enough. I've, I've accounted for this. <laughs> All right, so there is the Roman province of Palestinia, or Palestine. All right. Now, uh, as you, if you go to Wikipedia and go to the article Bar Kokhba Revolt, you also come across some accurate information. The writer tells us, Hadrian attempted to root out Judaism which he saw as the cause of continuous rebellions. And, and Judea was a restive subject peoples. There was constant uprisings, the uh, zealots, and um, various different uprisings, including the first Jewish revolt in 70 AD and the second Jewish revolt in 135. So he saw it as the cause of continuous rebellions. He prohibited the Torah law and the Hebrew calendar, and he executed Judaic scholars. For any of those of you who are aware, this is when Rabbi Akiva died. He was the leading rabbi of the day, and he was tortured to death. Oh, no. The sacred scroll was ceremonially burned on the Temple Mount. At the former Temple Sanctuary, he installed two statues, two idols. One to Jupiter, you know, the Roman god, and another to himself. The uh, Roman emperors loved emperor worship. So he's put himself right up there with their with their god Jupiter, okay? In an attempt to erase any memory of Judea or ancient Israel, he wiped the name off the map and replaced it with Syria, Palestinia. What was it called? Say again? The one before told what the war was called. Uh, the Bar Kokhba revolt. Bar Kokhba. K-O, yeah, we'll back it up here. Um, K-O-K-H-B-A on Wikipedia. Wikipedia. 
<laughs> I'll give you everything. Yes, you can have that. Yeah, look up Bar Kokhba Revolt. That'll be a good, a good topic for you to look up. Yeah. Okay, that's the second Jewish revolt okay. in 133 to 135 AD, I believe. All right, so he wiped the name off the map and replaced it with Syria Palestinia by destroying association of Jews to Judea and forbidding the practice of Jewish faith. Hadrian aimed to root out a nation that engaged heavy casualties on the empire. So, similarly, he reestablished Jerusalem, but now as the Roman pagan polis, the Roman pagan city of Aelia Capitolina. And the Jews were forbidden from entering it, except on the day of Tisha B'Av. What happened on Tisha B'Av? Why, why would he allow it there? That's when the temple was destroyed. So you guys can come back into your city to weep and mourn. You know, you can come into your city to weep and mourn, but all the rest of the time you stay out of Jerusalem. It's no longer Jerusalem, it's Aelia Capitolina. So that's the history of the name Palestine. And uh, it is stuck with us to this day. Okay, and I don't like the name, so I call it... You know, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I don't like that name, it's inaccurate. And so I don't like the covenant called the Palestinian Covenant. So if you go to your commentary or your study Bible and you see Palestinian Covenant, take your pen and, or your mark a lot, your marks a lot, and mark it out and write, <laughs> write uh, land covenant over the top. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, you'll see it in Bibles. Oh yeah, sure, of course. So you'll you'll see it. Oh yeah, it's all over. Yeah, but yeah, and they don't seem to understand where the name came from or what's it all about. It's an insult. To the Jewish people. It's a deliberate uh, insult. Yes? Yeah, you, you recommended two books to us. The, the Dictionary of New Testament Words. Okay. It is uh, the Little Kittle? Or yeah, yeah, the Little Kittle. Yeah, the little New Testament. New, yeah, the Dictionary, New Testament Dictionary. Yeah. Well, and then there's the, the Old Testament. I couldn't find the, the abridged Old Testament. Okay, well, come up and see me, and maybe we can locate the name for it and the author, okay? All righty. Okay, well, let's go on then. All right, so we're going to be looking at the land covenant here in Deuteronomy 28 through 30, verse 10, 2864. Now, the three basic promises of the Abrahamic covenant are expanded and developed through three additional eternal and unconditional covenants God made with the Jewish people. Now you have this chart on page 24. Okay, so if you want to turn to page 24, you can turn to it. If not, you've got the material, so don't worry about it. So here it is. We started out with our Abrahamic covenant, our eternal and unconditional Abrahamic covenant, and now on this chart I have uh, allowed room for the three additional eternal and unconditional covenants that God made with the Jewish people. He's made, God has made four unconditional eternal covenants with the Jewish people and one temporary and conditional covenant. The temporary and conditional covenant is the Mosaic covenant and these other four covenants are different, it's, they are eternal and unconditional, okay? So that's the, uh, the difference. So first of all here, the spiritual blessing promise of the Abrahamic covenant is it expanded and developed by the new covenant of Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. By the way, we live under the new covenant today. The national promise or the nation promise is expanded and developed by the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel, 1 Chronicles, Psalm 89, etc. And then the covenant that we're interested in for this class, the land covenant, is expanded and developed by the land covenant of Deuteronomy 29 and 30. All right, does that make sense? Okay, they're all tied in that way. So the emphasis of the land covenant is, of course, on the territory, the land of Israel itself. So this land covenant will develop that promise to a greater degree. Now, before I go any further, I think it's important that I explain to you the uh, fact of disobedience and discipline for disobedience that exists under these unconditional eternal covenants. Even though a covenant is unconditional and eternal in nature, 
It does not exempt the recipients from covenant responsibilities. You know, you don't get a free pass just because you're Jewish. And we don't get a free pass just because we're living under the new covenant today. If the recipient of an unconditional eternal covenant is disobedient, they will suffer discipline. Now the covenant will remain in effect, even though the covenant partner is disciplined, because it's a unilateral covenant. It depends upon God alone, not upon the behavior of the covenant partner. But discipline does hang over our heads for disobedience. Also, so, with that said, what are the disciplines associated with the Abrahamic covenant? So we're on page 18 right now, and we'll start in Genesis chapter 17. Now, uh, you, if you have your Bible with you, that's fine, but remember, every verse we discuss is going to be put up on the overhead. So uh, you don't have to have your Bible with you, but um, you can, of course, if that's more comfortable for you. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Now when Avram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Avram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. So we have the command here for Abraham to be obedient. He is to live upright. He is to be sincere in heart and speech and behavior. In other words, he's to develop godly character. He's expected to behave as a godly person. All right, let's move on to verses 2 through 8. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Avram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Avram, but your name shall be called Avraham. For I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. I have made you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. All right, so in verse 2, God states to Avram that he's about to confirm the covenant with him. He's not instituting the covenant here, but he's confirming it. The covenant was instituted way back in Genesis 12. So God confirms the covenant in a number of ways. First of all, he exalts Abraham by changing his name from Avram to Avraham. Avram means exalted father. Avraham means father of a multitude. Now, this was realized when the descendants of Avraham became the progenitors of whole nations. And that's where the, uh, that's where the uh, Arabs people, uh, Arab people consider Avraham, and he is their progenitor. Okay, they are descendants of Avraham. So this change from Avram to Avraham was further evidence of God's determination to fulfill the covenant. Now, in the ancient Near East, a change of name is an advertisement of some new circumstance in the history, the rank, or religion of the individual that bears the name. So this is a big deal in Abraham's life. This is a major event in his life. Well, then as we move on, the nature of the covenant is repeated. It's an everlasting covenant. I'm sure you recognize that as we read through it. And then God repeated the land promise. And after repeating the land promise, we come to the conditional expectations. We're on page 19, if you're following along there. We'll pick it up on verse 9, Genesis 17, 9. God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep, between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house, or who is bought with money from any foreigner who is not one of your descendants. 
A servant who is born in your house or who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So not only is Abraham expected to live righteously in the command in verse 1, he's required to circumcise all the males in his household. So he is to obey in this manner as well. Now circumcision was nothing new. This practice was uh, practiced elsewhere in the ancient Near East, but here it achieved new meaning. It would remind Abraham and his descendants of the everlasting covenant. So for Abraham's family, it was a symbol of the covenant. Now let's move, move on to verse 14. Here, here we come to the discipline. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So anyone who disavowed circumcision for his children was disavowing the covenant. And he would suffer punishment for the disobedience. They would be cut off from the nation. Now this term, cut off, has a wide range of meaning. Some feel that the term cut off means the death sentence. And in some, in some contexts, that's what the term means. Others feel it means excommunication. And in other contexts, that's what it means. And remember, context is king. Context determines the meaning, right? Of course, right. So either way, either way that you take it, uh, the discipline is provided for disobedience. I, of course, think this is probably just a reference to excommunication. So you don't get a free pass just because you're associated with an unconditional covenant. Thus, the Abrahamic covenant, although conveying unconditional promises to Abraham, also included obligations by which individual descendants would express their faith and enjoy the blessings of the covenant. So circumcision was an act of obedience and faith. Now, a little aside here, this is not in your notes. Recently, there's been a, a big brouhaha around the world about circumcision. And uh, most of the world, I'm sure, thinks this is just a big deal. What's the big deal with all this, okay? But um, anti-circumcision laws are attacking the Abrahamic covenant. <coughs> That's the point. For example, circumcision wars. The other side weighs in. This is from the LA Times in um, 2012, late 2012. Maybe up there with abortion and health care reform, circumcision of male babies and children is shaping up to be one of the hottest issues in the socio-medical world over the next few years. In June, a German court ruled the circumcision was illegal. Denmark is reportedly looking into whether male circumcision violates the country's health laws. And of course, a, a law to ban circumcision was turned down here in California just recently. So this is not insignificant from a biblical point of view. Uh, what this is is just another one of Satan's attempts, and he is the prince of this world, he influences this world, just another one of his attempts to try to destroy the Jewish people. Because if you can stop circumcision, then the a Jewish person is uh, cut out of the covenant. Right. You know? And if all the people are gone, the nation promise can't be fulfilled, and the land promise can't be fulfilled, and God is shown to be powerless. God is shown uh, to be, he's not a, he's not a covenant-keeping God. He's not true to his word, and Satan's career is safe. You see, Satan's career is over when the Abrahamic co covenant is fully fulfilled. Over. Okay, and he knows that. And so all the anti-Semitism we see today, all this kind of stuff, is Satan trying to preserve his career. That's what it boils down to, okay? All right, so that's just an aside. Keep your eye out. And uh, when you see anti-circumcision laws, realize this is not a m small thing from the biblical point of view. All right, for one last point, we're going to drop down to verses 19 through 21. So dropping down to verse 19, we read this. But God said to Abraham, No, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, for I will establish my covenant with him. Uh, Abraham was saying, oh, Establish your covenant with Ishmael. Remember the child of the uh, Egyptian handmaid. But God says, 
my, I will establish my covenant with Isaac for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him. And this is the Arab peoples. This is the Arab peoples that came out of Ishmael. I will bless him and make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. And he'll become the father of 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. Has that happened? Yeah, that's happened. But my covenant I will establish with Yitzhak, with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. Very clearly, the covenant goes through Abraham, Isaac, <coughs> Jacob, and the 12 <coughs> tribes. Okay? Cindy, question? Yes, the 12 princes. Yeah. Yeah, those would be 12 tribes, 12 nations that have come out of Ishmael. They're named in Genesis. You'll see them all named there. Okay? All righty. So the point of these two verses is the idea that the blessings of the covenant are reserved, reserved for Isaac. Blessings are abundantly promised to Ishmael, but it is through Isaac and Isaac alone that the Abrahamic covenant will run. So that's the conditional or obedience requirements of the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham is unconditionally promised an eternal covenant, but to experience the benefits of the covenant, his descendants must practice obedience. Now, the New Covenant, page 20. If you're following along, we're on page 20. What is the discipline for disobedience in the New Covenant? All right, let's begin in Jeremiah 31. This is the New Covenant. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. That's the Mosaic Covenant. We entered into the Mosaic Covenant at Mount Sinai shortly after leaving Egypt. My covenant which they broke. The Mosaic Covenant was broken by Israel over and over again. Although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. <coughs> they will not teach again, each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. So God's new covenant involves the internalization of his law. He will put his law in their minds and in their hearts, not just on stones. And remember, the Mosaic Covenant was written on tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments, the, the summary of the covenant. And there will be no need to exhort people to know the Lord, because they will all know the Lord personally. So God's new covenant will give Israel the inner ability to obey his righteous standards and thus enjoy his blessings. And you and I, you know, live under the new covenant today. Those of you that are Gentile believers are grafted in. Okay? That's why the Holy Spirit indwells us. Those of us that are Jewish believers, we're part of the, of the olive tree. And you're grafted in an organic relationship with us. Now the prophet Ezekiel also talked about the new covenant in Ezekiel chapter 20, 36. Ezekiel indicated that this change would result from God's bestowal of the Holy Spirit on the believers. Now, in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did not universally indwell believers. So one different aspect of the New Covenant is the indwelling Holy Spirit within all believers. And the second aspect of the New Covenant is God's provision for sin. Yes? Um, you know, you just said, like, the certain people had the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Yes. God would, God would give them, would it just be temporary? Yes. Like, Yes, they were like Abizel. He was the uh, architect of the um, of the uh, Mishkan, the uh, tabernacle. He was given the Holy Spirit uh, t in order to uh, oversee all the workers on the uh, on the uh, Mishkan, on the tabernacle. David prayed. Remember when David sinned? Take not your Holy Spirit from me. David was anointed with the Holy Spirit in order to lead Israel, and because he sinned, he was afraid that God would discipline him by removing the Holy Spirit. So that's a fine, perfectly fine Old Testament prayer, but it's not something that relates to us today. So there's a couple of examples. The Holy Spirit came upon some people 
temporarily for special uh, empowering. David, Bezalel, etc. All right, the second aspect of the New Covenant is uh, God's provision for sin. The sins of the people resulted in the curses of the Old Covenant, and he's referring to the Mosaic Covenant there. However, as part of the New Covenant, God will forgive Israel's wickedness and remember their sins no more. Now, how could this happen? How can a holy God overlook sin? And the answer is that God did not overlook sin. Instead, he paid its penalty by use of a substitute. By use of a substitute. In the upper room, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ, announced that the new covenant was to be inaugurated through the shedding of his blood. He's the substitute. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Here it is, Luke 22:20. 20. Passover, A.D. 30. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So that's when the new covenant was instituted back in the first century. And forgiveness of sin would be part of the new covenant only because God provided a substitute to pay for the penalty required of man. And so we live under the new covenant today. And so we are expected to be obedient as well. And did you guys know that in the New Testament there are over 600 commands to obey? S over 600 commands. And if we don't obey, there are two kinds of discipline. First of all, the church restoration procedure in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. In other words, excommunication. And the second discipline is loss of reward. And that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 through 15. Paul writes, now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. The fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on, built on it, on the foundation, on Jesus, remains, he will receive a reward. Reward for obedience. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. He won't, lo he won't lose his salvation. He'll lose rewards. But he himself will be saved yet as through fire. So we live under this unconditional eternal covenant today. That means we are in eternally secure. We are guaranteed eternal life. But at the same time, we are expected to live righteously. We are expected to obey. Otherwise, we will suffer excommunication or loss of rewards. And you know, Paul put it this way in Romans 6, 1. He said, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? We are to live as righteous people. All righty. Well, that takes care of the uh, discipline for disobedience under the new covenant. We'll pick up the Davidic covenant after your break. So go ahead and take your break. It's going to be a short one. It's going to be 10 minutes. So, because uh, I'm running out of time. And we'll pick it up on page 21. All right, we're back underway. We're on page 21 of your workbook. And we'll look at the discipline for disobedience under the Davidic covenant. We're now looking at the Davidic covenant, the, uh, another eternal and unconditional covenant God made with the Jewish people. So. I can hear it, I can hear it. The, should she, she, should, chocolate ice cream, even so, chocolate ice cream, okay. <laughs> All right, she gets away with it because her ringtone is hot tikva. She gets away with it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's the only one I allow. That's the only one I allow. <laughs> okay, All right. <laughs> All right, oh, come on, no more laughing. This is serious stuff. No more fun. Okay. 
All right. So our expectations of, uh, of obedience and discipline for disobedience held true for David's descendants under the Davidic covenant. Now under the Davidic covenant, David was promised an eternal house, an eternal kingdom, and an eternal throne. Now his son Solomon then inherited the throne after him. However, Solomon was told by God that he was expected to live righteously. If he lived obediently, God would bless his line. However, if he or his de descendants disobeyed, God would not bless the line. And we see this, for example, in 1 Kings 9, verses 3 through 7. Here's one example of that. There's uh, four examples of this statement. Here's one of them. The Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built by putting my name there forever. This is the Solomonic temple. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. But as for you, if, notice it's conditional, if you will walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you, and will keep my statutes and my ordinances, then, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, just as I did, just as I promised to your father David, saying, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. But if, if you and your sons indeed turn away from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them and the house which I have consecrated for my name and I will cast out of my sight. So Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples. That's one example. Another example would be uh, 1 Chronicles 28, 6 and 7. He said to me, Your son Solomon is the one who will build my house and my courts. You know, that's the Solomonic temple. For I have chosen him to be a son to me, and I will be a father to him. I will establish his kingdom forever if he resolutely performs my commandments and my ordinances as is done now. Well, as it turned out, there was plenty of disobedience in Solomon's life and among a good, mum, a good number of his descendants. And finally, the disobedience got so bad with a king named Jeconiah that God cursed the descendants of Jeconiah. God said that no descendant would sit upon, would prosper sitting upon David's throne. And that's exactly what happened. No descendant of Jec Jeconiah ever prospered on David's throne. Only one, Zedekiah, reigned as king, but he did not thrive. He did not prosper. He was taken into Babylon. Help. Say again. I, have, I need help. Okay. The Davidic covenant is conditional or unconditional? It is unconditional to David. It's conditional to his descendants. David will have the eternal throne and kingdom, etc. But it depends on the obedience of his descendants, uh, who the line will go through. Okay. So his descendants. David will have the covenant fulfilled to him. Okay? okay? So the rest of uh, Solomon's or Zedekiah's descendants never reigned as king. Now with the Jeconiah curse, the promise of a king on David's throne passed from Solomon's line to the line of another descendant. And that other son of David was Nathan. And we know from the New Testament that both the line of Solomon and the line of Nathan are traced. Now Matthew traces Joseph's gene genealogy down through Jeconiah and down to Solomon and then to David. And Matthew points out that Jesus is not Joseph's son. If he was, if Jesus was Joseph's son, he could not sit on David's throne because of the Jeconiah curse. Now Luke, on the other hand, traces the genealogy of Jesus down from Jesus through Mary to Nathan and then to David. So Jesus can sit on David's throne because he is a direct blood descendant of David through Nathan. And no curse is associated with Nathan's line. Now the Davidic covenant is an eternal, unconditional covenant. David will have his eternal throne, his eternal kingdom, and his eternal house. 
But Solomon and his descendants forfeited the messianic line through disobedience. So that is the discipline for disobedience associated with the, with the Davidic covenant. The forfeiture of the messianic line. Solomon lost it. Now let me summarize. The discipline for disobedience under the Abrahamic covenant was to be cut off from your people. Under the new covenant, the discipline for disobedience is confrontation under the restoration procedure or loss of rewards in the kingdom. Under the Davidic covenant, the discipline was for forfeiture of the messianic line through Solomon. So with that background, let's take a look at the land covenant. So we're now on page 22. This is the covenant we're interested in, the land covenant. Now the purpose for this covenant arose out of certain statements made in the Mosaic Covenant. Remember the Mosaic Covenant is temporary and conditional. Now it was clear from Moses' own prophecies in chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, Leviticus 26, that Israel will fail to keep the Mosaic Law. This failure to keep the Mosaic Law will bring on discipline and eventually there would be a worldwide dispersion. That's what the Mosaic Law predicted. A worldwide dispersion will come because of failure under the Mosaic Law, under the Mosaic Covenant. And the key reference to this is Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 68, and we will just look at verses 64 through 68, the very end of that section. In regard to the curses of the covenant, God says, Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all peoples, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. That's why I'm living here in Southern California. And there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone, which you or your fathers have not known. Among those nations you shall find no rest, and there will be no resting place for the sole of your foot. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing of eyes and despair of soul. So your life will hang in doubt before you and you will be in dread night and day and shall have no assurance of your life. In the morning you shall say, would that it were evening. And in the evening you shall say, would that it were morning. Because of the dread of your heart which you dread and for the sight of your eyes which you will see. Lord will bring you back to Egypt in ships by the way about which I spoke to you. You will never see it again. And there you will offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves. But there will be no buyer. Pretty serious stuff, huh? Pretty serious stuff. Now, the question that can be raised is this, does Israel's failure under the Mosaic Covenant render the promises of the first covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant, null and void? And the answer is no. The land covenant teaches that after a period of worldwide dispersion out of the land, there will be a worldwide regathering back to the land. Now the uh, provisions of the land covenant are found in Deuteronomy 29, through Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 10. Now we're going to, uh, if you go to page 24a, you will find these four slides. So I'll just build these slides in front of you, but you have these slides on your handout, page 24a. You got that all? Okay. Now verse 1 clearly differentiates the land covenant from the Mosaic covenant. So scripture is Deuteronomy 29 verse 1. And the point of Deuteronomy 29 verse 1 is that this is a distinct covenant. Here's how it's worded. Deuteronomy 29 1. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the sons of Israel in the land of Moab besides the covenant which he made with them at Horeb. All right, so in your chart, there's the, there's the significance. It's a distinct covenant made in Moab and it's in addition to the covenant made at Horeb. Now here's the map of the Middle East. Here is the plains of Moab, north of the Dead Sea. Down south, this is the Horeb mountain range. So we have two different locations, 
Two different covenants, 40 years apart. Make sense? Okay, two different covenants. All right, so there's our first verse. Then he's going to entreat uh, the Jewish people to enter the land covenant sincerely. And, and so that's point uh, two here. In verses chapter 29, verses 2 through 27, he's then going to describe Israel's past, present, and future history. And that's going to be characterized by disobedience. This is one of the reasons why I believe the scripture is um, inspired by God. Because if I was writing the history of my people, I wouldn't write that our history is characterized by disobedience. You know, I'd write us in, up in positive terms. I'd have a positive spin on it, okay? But scripture is honest, okay? Then in verses 26 and 27, at the end of this section, he's going to warn of God's judgment against covenant breakers for disobedience. Now this judgment will include a scattering out of the land to the four corners of the world. So let's take a look at um, this threat of worldwide judgment. Where, If you're looking on in your notes, it's the bottom of page 22. So here's Deuteronomy 29, verses 26 and 27. They went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they have not known and whom they had not allotted to them. Therefore the anger of the Lord burned against that land to bring upon it every curse which is written in this book. So there's the warning against covenant breakers. And now verse 28. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and in fury and in great wrath and cast them into another land as it is this day. Now we'll see that this uh, dispersion is worldwide in just a moment. Now we're going to move into Deuteronomy 30 verses 1 through 10. And he lays out the provisions of the land covenant. Now all these provisions center around the thought that after a period of worldwide scattering, Israel will be returned to the land. So here's uh, aspect number two. We move now on to aspect number three. Deuteronomy 29, 28 through verse, chapter 30, verses 1 and 2. Aspect number 3 deals with the dispersion. And the dispersion will be worldwide in nature. But at the end of that dispersion, God promises Israel will repent. We'll change our mind. So let's take a look at these verses. We pick it up on verses 1 and 2 of chapter 30. So it shall be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind in all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you, so it's worldwide, and you return to the Lord your God, that's, that's a repentance, and obey him with all your heart and soul according to all that I command you today, you and your sons. So there's that uh, description of a worldwide a dispersion with the repentance at the end of it. And now we come to verses 3 through 10. Verses 3 through 10 deal with the restoration to the land. And this deals with Israel's future. This has not happened yet. And we'll be talking more about this as we go along. Deuteronomy 30 verses 3 and 4. Then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. So this speaks of the uh, fact that the Lord will regather Israel in verse 4. And in verse 5, uh, Israel will prosper in the land. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Then in verse 6, uh, Israel will be regenerated or born again. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. And so that statement about uh, circumcision of the heart is a biblical way of saying being born again or being saved. Whatever terminology you want to use there. Th yes. This world Right, he's looking ahead here to the second regathering. Okay, we're dealing here with the first regathering. We'll get into this in just a minute. Okay. Now, or I should say soon. 
not in just a minute, but it's soon. Okay, does that make sense? He's jumping all the way to the second worldwide regathering here. All right, we'll learn about that later. Okay, in verses 7 through 10, the Lord your God will inflict all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the Lord and observe all his commands, all his commandments which I command you today. Then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly in all the work of your hand, in the offspring of your body, and in the offspring of your cattle, and in the produce of your ground. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. So finally, Israel will receive the full blessings of God, which is specifically here the blessings of the Messianic kingdom. But again, did you see? Blessing is predicated on obedience. Now Moses closes the section in verses 11 through 20 by again exhorting Israel to enter into the covenant with an honest and sincere heart. So if we summarize the Abrahamic covenant, we can summarize it in three essential provisions. There's a promise of the land, there's the promise of the seed, there's the promise of spiritual blessing. Now what the land covenant reaffirms is the land promise of the Abrahamic covenant. Now failure under the Mosaic law will not render God's promises under the Abrahamic covenant null and void. Now this chart here is just a summary of the land covenant. I'm just summarizing those four, those four slides you already have. So the land covenant in summary, number one, it's distinct in verse one. Number two, it deals with Israel's disobedience in verses two through 29, that's Israel's past history. Uh, the third aspect deals with the worldwide dispersion and the repentance that will, end it, uh, that will bring that dispersion to an end. And then fourthly, Israel will be restored, and that is in the future, Israel's future. The Abrahamic covenant is an eternal and unconditional covenant. It will find its fulfillment. That's the promise of the land covenant. Israel will be restored eventually. Well, Question. You said the promise of the land, promise of the sea. And the spiritual blessing promise. Spiritual. spiritual blessing promise, yes. Now in the middle of uh, page 23, I want to emphasize the eternal nature of the land covenant by just taking a quick thr trip through Psalm 105 verses 8 through 11. So we're on page 23, kind of the uh, center of the page there. Again, just to emphasize the uh, eternal nature of the covenant, in verses 8 through 11 we read, He has remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. The covenant which he made with Abraham, his oath to Isaac, then he confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion of your inheritance. So notice here in Psalm 105 the emphasis on the Abrahamic covenant. It's an eternal, unconditional covenant. And likewise, Jewish ownership of the land is eternal according to verse 11. The Jewish people have been given that territory, that little notch of territory, you know, smaller than mo almost all the countries in the world. That little tiny bit of territory was given to the Jewish people. Now, let me add some comments from Jeremiah at the very bottom of the page there regarding the duration of the title deed to the uh, land of Israel. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 7, verses 5 through 7. Uh, God says through Jeremiah, For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, or the widow, and if you do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Notice the conditional nature of blessing. We're to live righteously. Jeremiah 25, 5. We'll take a look at that one. God says, Turn now everyone from his evil way and from the evil of your deeds and dwell in the land which the Lord has given you and to your forefathers forever and ever. 
So God doesn't want us to uh, be exiled from the land, but he does want us to be obedient and live righteously. Jeremiah 31, verses 35 through 37. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order, the sun, the moon, the stars, if this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will also cast off the offspring of Israel for all they have done, declares the Lord. So can the heavens be measured? We've tried. We're using the Hubble. We're trying to find the end, the edge of the universe. And all we keep finding is more galaxies. On and on and on. And uh, Jules Verne wrote, A journey to the center of the earth. That can't be done. Can't be done. So, you know, the, the people that try to destroy us are using the wrong techniques. They're using guns and bullets and gas and all that kind of stuff. But God tells them a guaranteed way to destroy the Jewish people. Send a rocket to the sun and destroy it. Send a rocket to all the stars and destroy them. Destroy the moon. Yeah. Then the Jewish people will cease to be. So they're using the same, the wrong techniques. The wrong techniques. God lays it all out there. All right, page 24. Page 24. Middle of the page there. My point, my point is that I've established the validity of Zionism from the scriptures. The descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are given, or have been given, the title deed to the land of Israel. The, the deed, the title deed is ours, whether we occupy the land or not. In fact, it's predicted in scripture that there will be a time of worldwide dispersion out of the land, followed by a regathering. Now, there are two regatherings we'll learn in Scripture. And the modern Zionist movement, that's the subject of this course, is a brief look at the first regathering. So, Zionism is not limited to subjective emotion. Emotional, it is. But it is backed by biblical support. Zionism and the Jewish return to our homeland is an important part of the plan of God for this world. Now, at this point, I have to disagree, and this is not in your notes, but I have to disagree with prominent church leaders of the current time. There are, there's a movement going on in the church today among evangelical Christians to, uh, it's called an, um, an anti-Zionism, Christian anti-Zionism. And I really have to disagree with these people. And here are some of these people. Now the reason I disagree begins in Psalm 24 verses 1 and 2. Now we've established Zionism as God's plan for this world, but who is the boss here? Psalm 24 verses 1 and 2, the earth is the Lord's. Okay, is the territory of Israel the Lord's? Yes. Is the United States the Lord's? Yes. And all that it contains, the world and those who dwell in it, are you the Lord's? Yes. We are all subject to the King of Kings, okay? For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Now we might rebel against this, but uh, that's not going to stand because the earth and all who dwell on it belong to the Lord's. So we have to remember that. He's the boss. What he says goes. And then in Deuteronomy 32, we learn this fact. Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance. See, he's the boss. He can determine the boundaries of the nations. He determined the boundaries of Russia, the boundaries of Japan, the boundaries of China, the boundaries of the United States, okay? When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, he separated the sons of men. When he separated the sons of men, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. So he took into account his chosen people whenever he set up the boundaries of the nations. Don't ask me any more than that. All I know is that God's in charge and that's what he did. All right? For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. And he gave us this little sliver of land on the uh, western end of the Mediterranean Sea. And he gave many other nations a lot more land. But he did this 
uh, in consideration according to the number of the sons of Israel. So God is in charge, he's the boss. And so if he wants to uh, bring the Jewish people back, we have to ad uh, accede to that. Now, Christian anti-Zionism. Uh, what is Christian anti-Zionism? Anti now I've given you these articles from Israel My Glory and uh, page 33 uh, you see it's the, the back side of the first, uh, the first line there. On page 33 the author makes this comment which I think is a good comment. He says Christian anti-Zionists and he abbrevi abbreviates that C-A-Z-S Christian anti-Zionists are professing Christians who dispute the modern state of Israel's historical, legal, moral, prophetic, and or divine right to the promised land and the demarcated holy land of scripture. Okay, that's the movement that's uh, out uh, in the Christian church today. Now who are some of the people that are at the forefront of this movement? Now these are influential people. I disagree with them. What they teach is dramatically opposite of what I've just taught you. Be aware of these people. So you'll, you'll understand where they're coming from. Stephen Sizer, Vicar of Christ Church, Surrey, United England, the United Kingdom. He is one of the leaders in the Christian anti-Zionism movement. Uh, Gary M. Berge, Professor of New Testament at Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois. He is a Christian anti-Zionist. So be aware of that. Tony Campolo, speaker, author, sociologist, Professor Emeritus of Sociology at Eastern University in Pennsylvania. Israel has no right to the land is what he teaches. Uh, Lynn Hybels, author, activist, wife of Bill Hybels, senior pastor of Willow Creek Community Church, once the largest church in America, in South Barrington, Illinois. I've been to that church. She does not believe that Israel has a right to the land. John Piper, former pastor of Bethlehem Baptist Church of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and founder of Desiring God. These are all influential people. I see, I hear your reactions. What? These are all influential people in the Christian church today, in the Protestant church, and they feel Israel has no right to the land. I disagree with them. You should be aware of this. You should be aware of this. It's in the article here. I'm just quoting from the article, okay? In the article, the author brings out some, um, some influential organizations. Israel My Glory, this is page 34 of Israel My Glory. He names a Knox Theological Seminary. Notice how Knox portrays himself in their headline there. One of the top 20 seminaries in the U.S. So this seminary is training pastors. Wow. They teach that Israel has no right to the land. This is replacement theology. Be aware of it. Be aware of it. Know where people are coming from. Bethlehem Bible College. I've been to Bethlehem Bible College. Oh, I think it was 1995, 1996, uh, my first trip to Israel. I was at Bethlehem Bible College. We took a tour through that. We met the people. They are replacement. Israel has no right to the land. And most Palestinian Christians are replacement theology. Okay? So these are all influential people. Here's another guy. This is not in your article. This is another uh, fella, Colin Chapman. Lecturer of Islamic Studies, Near Eastern School of Theology, Beirut. He wrote this book, Whose Promised Land? From my perspective, it's a terrible book. I disagree with it totally. Uh, now this fellow here, Dr. Stanley Ellison, he's one of my profs. This is one of my profs from Western Conservative Baptist Seminary. I took classes under Dr. Ellison. He wrote a book, Who Owns the Land? Okay, he did a big study on this subject. And what was his conclusion? I was shocked. This is one of my profs. This is page 174. To put it bluntly, she, Israel, has no biblical right to the covenant land. Though her international right to the land can be well defended, her divine right by covenant has only sentiment in its favor. So I'm just teaching you some sentimental slop here is what I'm teaching you. Uh, I have to disagree with Dr. Ellison, yes. Um, is he a covenant theologian? No, he's a dispensationalist. He's at the, he was one of my profs at Western Conservative Baptist Seminary, a solid seminary, a dispensational seminary. And I was just blown over when I read his book. You know, I have to disagree with these people. You know, they're believers, but on this article, on this uh, subject, I can't agree with them at all. Yes. Can you give us this slide? You have the article. Oh, oh, which slide do you want? Dr. Ellison's slide. Okay. You have the the rest of it in the article here from Israel, My Glory. 
Now, in Israel, My Glory, on page 33, the author lists common characteristics. How do these people come to this conclusion that Israel has no right to the land? And I agree with three of his five reasons. I think reason three and four are kind of weak. But he does uh, share three reasons that I agree with, uh, three characteristics. Number one, Christian anti-Zionists wrongly assume New Testament revelation has more value than the Old Testament. And I have seen that over and over and over again in churches. Why do we need this Jewish stuff? Why do we need to study this Jewish stuff? You know, but this is the foundation. This is 75% of the revelation. In fact, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16 and other verses, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for cor correction, for training in righteousness. Not just the New Testament, all of scripture. So I disagree with them. Another characteristic of Christian anti-Zionists, they use the allegorical method of interpreting scripture. And for example, the term Israel actually means the church. Okay? Whenever you come across Israel, it really means the church. Yes, in the Old Testament, in the prophets. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, this is really speaking of the church. Okay? All the promises go to the church, the curses stay with Israel, but the promises, the good stuff goes to the church. Uh, the, uh, another position they take, we are in the kingdom now. This is the kingdom. What is the kingdom? Well, we believe it literally. They say the kingdom is just a figure of the prosperity of the church. Others say we're in the tribulation now. See, when you get allegorical, you go anywhere you want. Others say that this is the tribulation that we're experiencing now. Why is that? Because the tribulation is just a figure of the struggle the church will go through. You know? So you see, when you get allegorical, you can go anywhere. You can go anywhere. Now, this is, this is um, different from what I teach you. What I teach you is the golden rule of interpretation. When the plain sense of scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Okay, that's the position we take here at Hadavar. Therefore, take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning, unless the facts of the immediate context studied in the light of related passages and axiomatic and fundamental truths indicates otherwise. So that's a mouthful, but basically it means take the, the uh, writing of scripture in context and literally, unless there's a darn good reason not to. So Israel means Israel, and the kingdom means the kingdom. And the tribulation means the tribulation. They're not figures of speech. And the uh, fifth common characteristic, again, I disagreed with three and four. I didn't think that they were that strong. But I agree with this one. Christian anti-Zionists evidence a lack of humility in their standing before God by their treatment of Israel. And he's right. This is what Paul experienced in the Roman church back in the first century. That's why he had to write Romans 9, 10, and 11. Because a replacement theology had already reared its ugly head back in the first century. And a lot of churches skip over Romans 9, 10, and 11. In Romans 11, 18, he talks about the problem. This is his word, not my word. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. That's Israel. He's talking of the, he's, he, he's drawn the, um, the uh, olive tree analogy here. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember it is not you who supports the root. The root supports you. So he's using the olive tree analogy there. And this is the problem. And again, don't tell people that Bob said the Christian anti-Zionists are arrogant. I didn't say that. Paul said it. All right? I'm just repeating what, uh, what he's stating here. So this is replacement th theology and Christian anti-Zionism. Be aware of it. Now, books to read to uh, counter this trend in the church today. Future Israel by Barry E. Horner. I would, I would recommend you getting this book, Why Christian Anti-Judaism Must Be Challenged. He goes through this issue in detail of replacement theology and allegorizing the scripture. So I recommend this, Future Israel by Barry E. Horner. And I also recommend Israelology by Dr. Fruchtenbaum, The Missing Link in Systematic Theology. Uh, this book contains everything the Bible teaches about Israel, past, present, and future. We have some copies here if anyone's interested in it. So, uh, Future Israel and Israelology. <clears throat> Two books I would recommend you get uh, to counter this trend 
uh, at least in your own thinking, okay? All right, well, enough of that. All right, I've kept you over by five minutes. I'm not going to apologize for that. Tough break. All right, let me pray, and we'll pick it up next week on uh, page... Um, on page 24, at the bottom of page 24, with the prof prophetic significance of the uh, modern state of Israel. As we work through this biblical background, you have to understand this background or you'll never understand the modern state and what's going on in the world today, okay? So let me pray. Father, again, we want to just stop and um, look to you and thank you for your word. And it's a very sobering word, Lord. We have the, the great promise of unconditional and eternal covenants that don't depend on us, you know, in our failures, and our weakness. But your promises to us depend on you. And you will see that your promises are fulfilled, and we're very grateful for that. But we also see, Lord, that you do demand obedience from us, that we don't get a free ride. We don't just coast through this world, do anything we want. We don't... Uh, live in an unrighteous manner. We are to obey and live the way you uh, uh, command us to live, righteously. So help us, Lord. We struggle with that every day. I struggle with that. I know everyone in this room struggles with living the way you want us to live. So help us through your Holy Spirit to grow in our character so that we will become the type of people you want us to be. And we know that this will reach its fulfillment when the kingdom comes and the resurrection comes. So we look forward to that. But help us take this seriously every hour of every day. And we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Alrighty, we'll see you next week.